uh, sorry about that impenetrable abstract. <laughs> but the short version is that I use uh, computer models the best we can, uh, multi-processing parallel computer models to understand the physics of magnetized plasmas. And I, for the past 15 years, have been concentrating on the convective layers of our sun, though I've also worked on other stars and have other interests in, in well, other than just magnetic fields. Um, before I start, though, I, I just want to thank you guys for inviting me. I, I was really thrilled to get the invitation to be here because back when I was in grad school, back in 1992, I had uh, I was doing an outreach event um, for the physics department, and you know, next to us at this event was a group in, in it was in Michigan. It was a Michigan State University. And next to us at this event was a, a group of amateur astronomers, and I've never heard anything about amateur astronomy, and Boy, did they give a better demonstration than anything <laughs> the crap that we were doing. <laughs> I, I was just so impressed because everybody was so knowledgeable and was so enthusiastic. It really did leave an impression. And at the time, um, I was not um, doing astronomy. Uh, at the time, um, I was studying uh, to become a high energy phys physicist, which is, you know, those are the people that slam protons together and break apart things and multi-billion dollar accelerators. <laughs> and um, I got my first lesson about that time and what it is to actually try to be a professional scientist in that you know, around then they canceled the superconducting super collider, yeah. which meant that all of us and you know the high energy group were like, well, <laughs> you know, even our professors would say, you know, yeah, good luck. <laughs> you know, so we were all trying to figure out, you know, what the next step was, and I get this phone call um, from a guy I didn't know at the time, and he was a professor, um, rather well-known one, but I didn't know it at the time, and he said, have you ever considered astrophysics? And I said, well, um, you mean as a career? No, but I've always been interested in astrophysics, and I, and I was thinking to myself, well, you know, I, when I was a kid, uh, we were talking about this at dinner, I, I read a book called, from Isaac Asimov called The Collapsing Universe, which was about uh, black holes or the knowledge of black holes at the time, and I've been really interested in that, you know, my whole life, and I just hadn't thought of astrophysics. And then he, so I said, yeah, that actually sounds cool. And then he said, well, in specific, would you be interested in solar astrophysics, studying the sun? And my first reaction was, <laughs> the sun? You know, I didn't say this out loud. It's like the sun, it's kind of boring, isn't it? You know? <laughs> it's just that thing, that yellow thing that just predictably rises in the east and the west. So, long story short, no, too late. Um, <laughs> I ended up working with them, and uh, ever since then, I just have kind of been on a trajectory of astrophysics and solar physics. And it's, it's fascinating. So, so, what I hope to present to you guys is. Um, why it's not boring, why it's interesting as a science, um, why it, it covers you know, what we can learn from observing the sun and calculating the physics of the interior of the sun applies to a lot of different areas of science. So anyway, so why is the sun cool? So I always start to talk with uh, why is it important, and I think for you guys, for astronomers, um, one of the main difference, differences between um, doing astronomy and doing solar astronomy is the following. Um, it's a pretty crappy slide, but what I mean by that is that you guys, or stellar astronomers, are always looking at point sources. So if you, if you want to get maximize the information you can get from a point source, what do you do? Well, you do photometry, you do spectroscopy, um, and you take the laws of physics, the best that you know them, and try to tie that all together to write a picture and tell a story about what it is you're looking at. Now, there are many things that are resolvable, of course, in the night sky, but I'm thinking of stellar astronomy. So the principal difference from an observational point of view, anyway, uh, for solar physics, is that you're dealing with this, which is, it's a star, of course. Um, to learn anything about it, you need to use the laws of physics, photometry, spectroscopy, but the difference is, is you do it as a function of position on the disk, so it's resolvable, which makes it a much more complicated problem, but a much more deep and interesting problem. 
So the other thing that we're always, I mean, that's kind of the thing I thought that might be of interest to people that are, are looking at, at stars. Um, but as scientists, what we need to do is to be able to explain to the general public why you should pay for this type of thing, <laughs> right? Especially nowadays. So it's always good to think about that. I mean, why study the sun? I mean, a lot of it is obvious, of course, because you know, without the sun, we wouldn't be here. Um, it is, in fact, the driver of all things climate. It's the source of every bit of energy. That, you know, the stuff we dig up and burn, that's all solar power, if you think about it, right? Without the sun, none of that would be there. None of the energy that created the solar system or anything else would, would, would be here. So that's an obvious one. But I think it's important to note that it, it really is a unique window into the just basic physics of plasmas. You know, we want to try to create as much as we, as we can on a tabletop experiment or a, a super collider or something like that that we can measure and we can interact with. That's really the heart of science, I think, is observing something and trying to understand it. And what the sun does from a basic physics point of view is, is that it allows us to uh, have a laboratory that we just couldn't possibly recreate here on Earth. It has its challenges, it's still remote sensing, but it's a fantastic lab. Now, the, the government uh, funders uh, want actual societal impact, so the, the, the reason, you often hear the justification of basic science in terms of what can we do for you now? And with the sun, it's very easy to understand. So solar variability, um, our sun really isn't just a you know, yellow orb in the sky. It's magnetically active, and it's very, very uh, variable uh, in, in a predictable way. Um, but now that we have zillions of satellites surrounding us, or we have all of this billions and billions of dollars in infrastructure, electric power grids, uh, satellites, computer networks, uh, transportation, airlines, space based assets, uh, military hardware, and um, all of that really depends, uh, the health of that depends on being able to mitigate the effects of what's called space weather. So yeah, I'm sure you've seen on CNN every now and then when there's a solar flare or a coronal mass ejection, you'll see these cool movies where a bunch of the sun kind of barfs out into space and then everyone goes screaming to the hills, right? <laughs> I mean, it, it really is important to understand and try to predict that because even though we're protect we are protected by the Earth's magnetic field and its atmosphere, satellites are not. So they really need to have some sort of warning and, and polar, you know, airlines going over polar routes, you know, they're, they're going to be exposed to more radiation. So that's a kind of a driver for some of the funding in current, currently in space weather. But the most important thing, I think, is that it's just, it really is interesting. And there's so much about the sun, as we were talking about earlier at dinner, that is just not understood. You know, we've been looking at it for a long time, and there's some very basic questions that we don't know the answer to. And I'll try to kind of go, go over that a little bit. So here's kind of the basic, uh, um, Facebook profile of our son. It's, uh, <laughs> it, when I was growing up, they, they used to tell me that you know the sun is an average star. I'm, I'm here to tell you that it's actually not particularly average. It's kind of average in age, I guess. It's sitting on the main sequence there. That's a plot. That's an HR diagram plot of spectral type versus uh, magnitude. Um, it's mostly made of hydrogen, there's, there's helium, it's powered by fusion in its core. Um, I think the point, the take home points here, is, the point here, sorry, is that it's a magnetically active star and, and that's something that's fundamentally interesting from a scientific point of view. It's actually atypical, it's more massive than most of the stars in our galaxy. <clears throat> and it's also hotter, so there's a lot of cool smaller stars lurking about out there. It puts out a ton of energy, um, you know, in all, in all directions, and we only, our, the Earth's cross section is pretty small, so we only get a small bit of it at ground level, but still it's a lot, 5,500 kilowatts per acre is nothing to sneeze at. And this is a uh, quote that I thought was kind of cool. Um, if the sun were a person, it would be seen by others around it in the sky as large, late, middle-aged, reasonably well-behaved and moderately right. 
<laughs> so here's uh, here's what you usually see um, in, in a textbook. It's kind of a cutaway cutaway of the sun, but it's still pretty instructive as a picture. So the reason the sun shines up there, of course, is that the pressure due to gravity um, pushes material together, and it gets so dense in the core that nuclear reactions start. So basically. Our sun has a big supply of hydrogen down there, protons, that are being fused together to form helium. And when that happens, a lot of energy is released. Um, it's not some weird, odd object in the sky because it, it's like most stars on the main sequence. They're stable. And what we mean by that is basically that the outward pressure from all those nuclear reactions are pushing outward against the inward pressure uh, as a result of the gravitational interaction. So it gets to this point that it's in balance, and we call that hydrostatic equilibrium. So that's kind of a stability condition. So the heat from the core, though, it's pretty interesting. It, it kind of gets out to the surface in a roundabout way. So uh, there, there's a stable part of the sun, basically, where you know if you're, if you're a photon, um, you're basically just colliding around in the interior. In fact, um, this is something that you might not be aware of, you, or you may be, um, that if it takes, it takes basically a photon about 100,000 years to make its way from the core through the uh, convection zone and out to the visible surface where, it, where, it, where we can see it. And then it only takes a couple minutes to get to Earth, right? <laughs> That's the speed of light. Um, so I don't know if you saw a few, few years back, there was a Star Trek movie um, where the, the bad guy <laughs> was shooting missiles into the sun or into the star, and it was Captain Picard, right, was trying to stop him and all that stuff. But basically what happened was is he chewed a missile into the star to shut down the energy of the core of the star. And then, of course, in the movie, the star just went dark and everybody freaked out, and oh my god, you know. So I'm here to tell you, if that guy shot <laughs> one of those deadly missiles into the core of our sun, you wouldn't know it <laughs> for 100,000 years. <laughs> so there's my inspirational quote for the evening. <laughs> so I'm not going to belabor the complexities of stuff, but since you're astronomers, I, I just thought I, you know, this is the photometry part of trying to learn about the sun. Um, we get. We still get all our information from analyzing spectra and analyzing the effects of magnetic field on spectra. And by spectra, what I mean is the emission that's caused by the energization of an atom, basically. So it turns out in quantum mechanics, you know, you, you dump a bunch of energy into an atom. The electron can't just go wherever it wants. It's got to go in these particular levels called quanta. That's why it's called quantum mechanics. And when they change those levels, what they do is they tend to spit out a photon at a certain wavelength. So if you get enough of those photons, um, you can get a signature of the atom itself that you're trying to understand. So a spectro uh, spectroscopy is about understanding those, the line emissions superimposed on the black body uh, continuum spectrum. So that's basically what I said there in, in a clock. So, so when, when you look at uh, pictures of the sun taken by solar telescopes, either on the ground or in space, um, they're going to look a lot different uh, depending on what wavelength you're looking at. And a lot of them are, you know, NASA will col colorize these images, so it's, that's kind of more artistic. But the real thing that we tend to look at is the uh, structure. So on the uh, top left, that's basically the photosphere. So that's, a, in some sense, just visible light um, <clears throat> in the solar disk there. I'm, I'm not sure what observatory that was taken. Um, as you look at different uh, spectra, you're looking at different parts of the atmosphere, and you're also looking at different temperatures in the atmosphere. I mean, you're doing both at the same time. It's just the things uh, generally in the solar atmosphere and corona get hotter, surprisingly, actually as you go higher up you know, into the atmosphere. So the one on the uh, upper right is from an instrument called, or uh, is an SEO uh, measurement from TRACE at uh, about a million degrees Kelvin, 171 angstroms. 
someone asked me earlier what the <laughs> um, what, what the uh, my title slide. They asked me what wavelength was, and I couldn't remember. Now I do because it's written down. <laughs> uh, so that that really was helium, and that is kind of the upper chromosphere. Below. That's actually low transition region temperatures of helium too. So that's the red colorized one. And then there's another coronal image there down at a little higher temperature of 1.5. So the trick to try to understand this is try to kind of put this all together and build a picture of what you think is happening on the sun. Is something there, there because you see it? <laughs> I know that's a silly <laughs> sounding question. Um, is it, or, or is something that is bright, is it because it's hot or is it super, a superposition of a whole bunch of things that you're looking through? It's a really complicated problem actually. And these images can be really uh, misleading. So how do we get all of these cool images? So two ways um, in solar astronomy, basically ground-based and space-based. Um, the obvious advantage of a ground-based telescope um, is that you can get to it, right? If something breaks, you can just climb up there, figure, fiddle around with it, and replace it. That's a huge advantage, by the way. The super huge disadvantage, of course, as you guys I'm sure know, is atmospheric turbulence, and probably even worse, atmospheric absorption. So if you want to get some of those cool X-ray images or EUV images, you're not going to be doing it from you know, a mountaintop, right? So that's why we got to shoot stuff up into, into space, and that's like way more expensive. Um, but there's a lot of things you can do if the radiation can actually make it to where you're at um, to make the images much sharper, much better, um, and kind of limit the diffraction. Um, so one of the main things that's really super interesting and what most modern telescopes use, as you I'm sure know, is adaptive optics. So what you do is you try to, in real time, understand the turbulence of the atmosphere in terms of the superposition of harmonics. Or you're basically using math to disambiguate um, the turbulence and then have your telescope be in chunks and then have you know, motors actually balance it out so that you can try to you know, get, get your image a lot sharper. Uh, I thought that was, when I first heard about it, I thought that was voodoo, but it really <laughs> works really well. It really works in real time and it's very, very common. Um, well, I think probably the, the best upcoming ground-based uh, observatory here in the United States is the uh, DKIST. I, I kind of knew it as the Advanced Technology Solar Telescope. So it's up on Mount Haleakala. I'm not really sure right now. Um, I, I think they had a lot of issues they were dealing with um, about getting it set up, environmental issues and, and other such things. So I think that everything is go, but I, I'm not an expert on this, so I'll kind of just say either it's running soon or, or either it's running now or will be running soon. I do know that um, the National Science Foundation is starting to take proposals for um, some of the... Um, is that four meters in diameter? Sorry? Is that four meters in diameter? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I think yes, four it's meters. It said four meters there. I just wondered. Sorry? It said four meters on your slide. Oh, let me let me go back. Bottom line there, four meters. Yeah, I mean that's referring to the mirror. And again, I'm not, I'm not honestly a ground-based astronomer, so um, I, I could have typed that wrong. I do know it's adaptive optics, optics, so and it's kind of an off that the axis configuration. <clears throat> so let me just kind of give you a sense of scale here. So this is kind of one of those. Um, White light images. Like this is from a ground-based telescope um, on the Canary Islands, and this is a movie. It's an animation created by, um, I think it was a graduate student at the time. And so I'm having a hard time finding my mouse. Oh, here we go. So it gives you the, some of the spatial scales that we want to try to get at here. They're kind of scrolling through different instruments here, and, and it's focusing in on an area of magnetic activity, which is kind of my area of interest. And now we're looking at something that's, uh, the scale there on the left is in megameters, so that's uh, 10 to the fifth kilometers. Um, so the Earth, for scale, has a radius of about 6,400 kilometers. So the Earth is going to be 
taken up a chunk of that picture, I guess, roughly speaking, if I can figure out how to use the thing. Roughly speaking, something like that. So the, obviously the sun is the, the big star in the neighborhood, and some of these active regions that we're talking about are far, far larger than, than the Earth. So this is a, another view. It's a, I thought it was interesting because this is a, I like to think of it as a side view of the granulation. So all that bubbly stuff that you see there is called surface granulation. And this is an image that they took. I guess, it, again, I'm not an expert in the observational part, but they must have taken it as it was, this active region was getting to the limb, was it rotating around. And I thought that's really cool because it gives you a, an idea of what's really going on there. So convection, is fairly easy to understand. I mean, we all boil a pot of water, right? So, so hot air, hot plasma will rise, then it will get up to the top, cool off and sink, and then you'll get rolling motions. That's exactly what's going on here at the sun. And the reason it's driven in such a way is because, as someone mentioned earlier, the transition is sharp uh, between the plasma, the surface, and the thin atmosphere. Just like when you're boiling a pot of water, the transition between the water and the air above the water is really sharp. The air above the water is way cooler than the water, and that just drives that vigorous convective turbulence. So very similar. So this is uh, not the same region, but just a picture. Of if you get a little higher into the atmosphere, and you look at uh, this one, it happens to be at 656 nanometers. Um, but I can tell you this is uh, uh, chromospheric plasma. So this is something that's about, these structures are probably about a thousand, you know, ranging from a couple hundred to a thousand, maybe 1,500 kilometers above the photosphere. So what happens is that, it's that at the photosphere, where all that stuff is grinding around, you know, turbulence, what, it, what it's doing is it's taking the magnetic field. The plasma is so dense, it's taking the magnetic field and shoving it around and creating more magnetic field. But as you get higher and higher in the atmosphere, the pressures and densities go way down. They become very sharply stratified and it becomes really uh, not very dense. So then the magnetic pressure rules the, rules the world and the plasma has to stay within magnetic field lines. And that's what we're starting to see happen here um, in the chromosphere. So those kind of structures, those spicules, those long, narrow things are the plasma that's been sucked up probably into magnetic fields and are constrained by that field. So when you look in the atmosphere, you're actually looking at a snapshot in some sense of the magnetic field. And when you're looking in the photosphere, you're looking at a snapshot of the optical emission of the swirling plasma. Question? Question? Um, oh, sure. Yeah, um, sorry. My hearing's not terribly good, so. <laughs> is that the sort of thing that you'd see through a hydrogen alpha yeah, that's exactly, it's exactly the type of thing. And in fact, I wanted to say that was H-alpha, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a movie, this is an observation. Um, and this is uh, a G-band, which is a certain um, uh, filter. And it just shows you, so, so what's going on here, if there weren't any magnetic fields on the sun, um, that granulation would be pretty much everywhere. But since there are magnetic fields of many, many different scales, or small scales, granular sky scales, really small scales, super strong, but the stuff we see as sunspots and activity on the surface, those are really strong concentrations of magnetic field. And they affect, they suppress the convection, and they, they cool down the plasma. And this is an image of you know, some of the fantastic um, physics that goes around in the, that you can see in the optical band of a sunspot. But the key here is this is a concentration of field, and it's pretty strong. So a sunspot's typical magnetic field is about 1,000 Gauss, which is, is quite a bit, 1,500 Gauss. So there's uh, more convection in the G-band showing little concentrations of field uh, called bright points. So I'm up here confidently saying this is all magnetic field, <laughs> right? But how do we know that? Right? I mean, we can't directly measure it. We have to kind of infer it. So to zeroth order, and I think this is a, 
always a good thing to do is kind of look at images and ask yourself, well, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, maybe it is a duck. So we've all done the uh, dipole experiment where you put a bunch of iron filings somewhere and then you drop a bar magnet in there and you can see a dipole field. And it turns out the sun's extended field is often, you know, it's very complicated, it's all messed up, there's all kinds of quadrupole moments and multipolar moments and everything, but essentially it is a dipole. And you can kind of see in a cartoonish way how these things, you know, how people always thought this stuff was magnetic related. But to really say for sure what's going on, again, you have to look to what you measure. In this case, it's a spectra of the sun. So a clear presence of a magnetic field is in the splitting of certain lines. So it's a kind of a complicated deal, but the spectra is affected by, the, by a strong magnetic field. So if you're taking a long, basically that line over there is, is a slit where they were taking a, 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 using a spectrograph, and that little slit right there along where that kind of where that active region is, you can see the line got split. And there's mathematics called the, the Zeeman effects that can tell you how strong that field is. It, what, it can tell you whether it's there, how strong it is. There's a lot, lot you can learn about the field from just studying the spectra. OK, so those were all ground-based measurements. So up in space, we so that whole Zeeman splitting thing um, and analyzing spectra is how we come up with these maps of magnetic fields on the surface of the sun. This is not a image. What this is is showing you the polarity of the magnetic, radial magnetic field, or wait a second, line of sight magnetic field on the solar surface. This was taken quite some time ago by an instrument called SOHO, the MDI um, instrument on SOHO, which is a satellite. It, this is a really nice image because even though it's not as high re resolution as they have nowadays, um, it really shows you right away that there are some global properties of the sun that just hit you in the face. And I can tell you, we do not understand how, the, how some of these global properties develop over time. And it's one of the main mysteries of uh, the solar magnetic field. People will often refer to it as the global dynamo problem, but what that really means is this idea of trying to understand, from a physics point of view, the solar cyclical activity and these type of global patterns. So what I mean by global pattern here that strikes, at least strikes me, is that these active regions seem to be emerging um, in certain latitudinal bands, and then they also have this certain tilt, you know, with respect to. Uh, the equator that is reversed in the southern hemisphere than in the northern hemisphere. So that was, a, that was just a slide from Soho. Um, so the work uh, excuse me, the work horse nowadays, or in the, past, in the past decade, has been the uh, Solar Dynamics Observatory. Um, it's not a new satellite now, it's an old venerable satellite. Um, there's two instruments on it. Um, there's one that, that uh, <coughs> called uh, the uh, HMI, Heliospheric Magnetic, Magnetic Imager, I think. Um, and so the, the purpose of that is to do high resolution, um, spatially, spatially resolved and at high temporal cadence um, images of what the line of sight or radial magnetic field is. So what we're looking at here is the evolution of the um, polarities of a particular active region. So, and there's tons of information in this, and this is to basically to understand the evolution of the field at the surface is incredibly important if we want to know how the sun is driving stuff into its atmosphere, creating all those explosions, and affecting you know space weather here here at Earth. So this is this is where the rubber meets the road. And it's massively complicated. There's convection happening at different scales. There's regions where the, you know, it could have been an active region that has decayed. Um, there's areas where there are what we call really high shear, where magnetic energy can build up and suddenly burst out. So this is a wealth of, wealth of information, actually. 
in the, uh, let's see, what is this? This is a, well, this is a, sorry, uh, I was starting to talk about SEO. This is something from Hino Day. Um, so it, this one is just, again, convection. But what's interesting here is this is a satellite image, I think, and they were able to um, make images of the chromosphere. So there was this nice inversion uh, pattern here, which I'll come back to later. It's uh, important to some of the stuff that I do computationally. Okay, so uh, back to SEO. Um, this is the trace. I'm sorry, this is trace. <laughs> um, right, so this is up in the corona, so it's about a million and a half degrees at 195, and this is a, the emergence of kind of a typical active region. It also has an eruptive event associated with it. And then um, you can see, I guess I just wanted to point out that the, one of the difficulties of trying to understand all of this is that it happens at so many different scales. I mean, this is, so this is the, this is the curvature of the entire sun. The triggers are down at really small scales and tiny, tiny scales up here as well. And then some of these structures are, are enormous, these ribbons here. And of course, when the CME goes off, that fills the heliosphere. So that's a, at a different scale in of itself. So that's really a principal challenge, at least for the theorists, is to understand how all this, all this stuff hangs together. This is kind of a nice image, just kind of illustrating that issue of scale again. And we're, again, working in the corona. Uh, this time at a slightly lower temperature, so you're seeing different features in a slightly different way. Now this one is, is you know, at yet again, a uh, different wavelength. This one actually is SDO, uh, atmospheric imaging assembly. And this is at uh, about 70,000 degrees, so uh, that would be, make it in a transition between the low atmosphere, which is the chromosphere, and the high energy corona. The cool thing here is this, these kind of blobs of crap that kind of <laughs> could go from the photosphere out into the corona are either we call them CMEs, which, accru which is a coronal mass ejection, that is if they, they initiate and then they barf out into the heliosphere and go careening towards the Earth, that's a CME. But if the magnetic field is in such a way that they don't have enough what we call magnetic free energy to actually erupt, um, then they'll just, this plasma will just hang there. And uh, that's often referred to as a prominence. That's actually a really huge prominence. Now, the material didn't go away. It just went to a higher temperature. So that's one of those things you kind of have to keep in mind when you do these things. This is just a cool image. And, and it's, you know, this magnetic field is large scale. It, it filled, the magnetic field is filling everything here. Um, and the things at the base are just super small and concentrated by the high energy plasma. So it's this fascinating transition. And you can see things like spiral things. The thing is though, when you look at this, um, when it looks like it's like this, you know, water that's spiraling down the drain, you can't think of it that way though, because up here, um, the, the water isn't doing its water thing. <laughs> it doesn't make much sense. But everything's controlled by the magnetic field. It, the magnetic pressure is in charge. So this is, in some sense, just kind of a way to visualize the field. So the, the way we think of it and look at it sometimes isn't quite what's actually happening. Sure. On the other picture, how fast did you say that is moving? I'm sorry? On the other, the previous sequence, how fast did you say that um, the prominence So sorry, I'm not hearing this crap. <laughs> Sorry. On the previous sequence, how yeah. fast did you say the uh, sort of the uh, prominence is moving? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So, what is the cadence of the image here? Um, I'm not sure on those particular images, um, but you you can kind of tell from the relative rotation speed that that it's not over a, a super long time scale. CMEs can go at hundreds; they can blast off at hundreds of kilometers per second, but there are variable, variable speeds of CMEs. Mm -hmm. um, they're fast ones, and they're, they'll go up much quicker than that, and slower ones. Prominences like this, where they've done or up hang there for quite a long time, I, I think the best answer I can give without looking it up um, is that they last roughly, they, they don't last as long as the life cycle of the active region itself. 
they're going to be controlled by the physics of the field on, at the surface. Mm -hmm. And those things go, you know, an active region can last, you know, um, you transit the disk over time scale of many months. You know, it varies, but time scale of months. Sorry, that's a kind of long winded <laughs> answer. <laughs> a really simple question. Yeah, these, these are not in real time. Not Sorry. Not in real time. They're speeded up. Oh, yes, yes. These are, these are sped up. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yep. Take all that. I, I, yeah, I should, I should have that in notes somewhere where the cadence is. I mean, a lot of these images are have different cadences, so I'm not quite sure. I, I didn't make the movies, obviously. <laughs> oh, so anyway, what are the, uh, what are the limits here? Um, so we can learn a lot by just looking at these things and more specifically analyzing the spectra. Um, but these are remote sensing. So basically, we are looking at an integrated. Um, in other words, there's a lot of stuff that's emitting, you know, along the line of sight, and you kind of have to disentangle that. So, on the Earth and geosciences and in, in regular terrestrial weather, I mean, we have a lot of we have a lot of sensors that are just embedded where we're at. We know what the wind speed is. We know what the temperature is. You know, all over the place. And so, models are a lot better because they have all of that information. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to get an in situ measure of the sun because it's hard to drive into the sun. Um, but of course, with the Parker Solar Probe, for the first time, we're going to have some in situ measurements of the sun. In situ, by the way, just means you know just you're lying in it, <laughs> right? So, yeah, its closest approach, I think, the Parker Probe is going to be traveling through the outer corona um, at about nine radi solar radii. So that's pretty close, but not in the million degree plasma. It's in the extended corona. So the temperatures there where it's going to be hanging out in its orbit are probably about 2,500 degrees, which is super hot. You don't want to hang out in 2,500 degree coronal plasma <laughs> if you can help it. But there are materials that can withstand that. And that will give us some of the first uh, measurements in situ of the electric and magnetic fields and uh, the abundances and properties of the corona. And that's going to be extremely useful, actually, because until now, the only way you could infer the magnetic field is through model, modeling based on observations of things based on spectra, again. So I'll just kind of skip through that. Actually, so, yeah, the slides said let's back up, but it's probably a good idea to back up that and mention that you know, a lot of this stuff has been known for a long time, right? People have seen sunspots, um, you know, <laughs> since the, you know, in the hundreds of BCs. And this is a famous image of a sunspot that was, I guess, from the 12th century. But the point here is that people have been looking at these things for a while and wondering what the physical properties are. Um, I was talking about, I'll get back to the imagery in a second, but I just wanted to back up here a little bit and define what it is that we're talking about when we say we don't understand global properties. And these are some of the global properties of the dynamo that have been known for a very, very long time. So uh, with these plots, that, you know, that hopefully they're not too complicated, but what they show you is uh, basically the sunspot uh, area and position as a function of uh, many solar cycles over a very long period of time. And the thing that you want to get out of this plot is that they're actually very regular. And so there must be a reason for that, right? There must be a physical reason. There must be a reason that magnetic fields do what they do on the sun and do it so regularly. And that's, again, called the solar dynamo problem. <clears throat> this is another image of what I was talking about before, that they're confined to these bands um, in the equator, or you know, above the equator. <coughs> They move poleward, which, which is what that other image showed you as, as a 11-year cycle progresses. Some of this, uh, yeah, hopefully it's not too boring, but, <laughs> um, but these are some of these properties that we're trying to explain. Basically, why is the leading polarity of an active region positioned closer to the equator than the trailing polarity, at least in the northern hemisphere? And why does the tilting of of these things increase with latitude, right? Because if the sun is just sitting there as a bubbly mess, why would you expect any regularity whatsoever, right? So you've got to try to figure out what the deal is. Um, so kind of to zeroth order, what does that tell us? 
Um, so this is kind of you know mid 20th century thinking here now, or early 20th century actually, um, that still I think applies today. So in 1919, uh, there's a, a solar astronomer, Hale, um, who said that well look if it does that, that must mean that the geometry of the field has to be uh, aligned basically in the sun's east-west direction. And it then has to kind of merge to the surface in some sort of um, understandable and discrete way if it's going to come up as spots. So we used to call this, this image like a, you kind of think of it as a rubber band, and this is called, we, we refer to it as a magnetic flux tube. It's a way of thinking about it. And that Hale's law is just persistent. We've never seen, you know, well, I mean, there's non Hale active regions, but generally active regions are Hale, you know, obey Hale's law. So that means if that's true, then the generation layer must be deep in the atmosphere. Otherwise, it wouldn't be so persistent. And they should be anchored, active region fields should be anchored in the conduction zone. So, how do we test this stuff? Well, um, one thing you can do, and this is what I do, kind of starting to get into the, the stuff that I do, um, is, is you use computers um, to solve systems of equations that you think are, are applicable in the region of the sun that you're interested in. So this is just an example of solving what's called, uh, it's called a MHD system, and that sounds more complicated than it is. Uh, Magnetohydrodynamics is just solving a bunch of con conservation equations, it's just saying that mass doesn't show up out of nowhere. Uh, Newton's laws are true. There's conservation of energy, and the laws of electricity and magnetism that we see here on Earth apply on the sun. And if you do that, um, and are reasonably good at a computer, you can start simulating these types of subsurface flows and try to understand in a kind of mathematical and technical way what you're seeing as things go to the surface. Um, the other thing, the other way that we get info about the sun that we can't directly measure that you might have heard of is this field called helioseismology. So, so the sun is, is basically a big blob of gas. It's being hammered you know, by all this convective turbulence. Magnetic fields are perturbing the structure. And what that does, since it's a gas, is it creates sound waves. And the effects of those sound waves in, in that material can be measured at the surface of the sun. And if you know what the sound waves are doing at the surface, you can use mathematics to try to infer what's happening deep in the interior. It's just like, so like beating a drum. You know, we know harmonics, you know, here, here on Earth. It's the same thing. We're just analyzing harmonics on the sun. And that's, some way that, that's a way that you can get information on the interior. And lots of interesting things have been learned. That's how we measure that the sun is rotating differentially, that the equator is rotating faster. Um, than, than the poles and so on and so forth. And it's how we realize and can show and prove, prove that, um, that the sun transition, there's a transition between a stable layer and a convective layer in the interior. So anyway, oh, one final thing I'll say, you know, I, I'm sorry if I delved into some kind of jargon there, but so here, here's the fundamental problem. <laughs> this, will, this will be a funnier slide after I explain it. Uh, dynamo model. So people for a long time have been trying to predict how many sunspots you're going to see in a solar cycle or what the strength of those sunspots are going to be based on our understanding of the process of those magnetic fields in the interior. Um, so these are the predictions for the number of sunspots over a number of years. It's, uh, it's kind of an older, older plot. But you can see the observed value up here is nowhere near any of the predicted values. So you, you kind of look at this plot and go, hmm, I guess we don't entirely understand what's going on. So uh, I'll just run by a couple other cool observations here. So this is a what's called a corona chronograph. Um, it's an instrument that, so here, here, now we're looking at a different scale. Here's the scale of the sun right there. And one of those mass ejections that we saw earlier, this is a picture of uh, the light it produces out in the in the heliosphere. So basically what they're doing is they're covering up the sun and allowing us to see what's going on in the heliosphere. 
And that's important here for our space environment. So that's what we're trying to understand is how all the stuff from here impacts the terrestrial magnetic field. Oops. So let me, I'm going to get through, I'm just going to kind of blast forward a little bit here. Um, So th this is what I so this is the stuff I've been doing recently. I just thought, just thought I'd show you some of some of these models. So again, this is this is what happens when you solve these equations. I'm sorry, I shouldn't show them, but they're <laughs> to please do not be alarmed. <laughs> this is, this just means that mass doesn't come out of nowhere. This is basically Newton's law. This is a uh, Faraday's law, and that's the conservation of energy. And if you solve all of that. <laughs> on a supercomputer and just let it run, you know, without cheating and trying to push it in ways that you think will make it look like observations, you really can create that, those patterns that you see on those images pretty well. Um, it's enough to where you can, now you have all of the information, you have the densities, of, you know, the magnetic field strengths, all that cool stuff. Um, and you can compare and see if what you did captures the physics of what actually, what actually is, is observed. So this is a simulated photosphere convection, uh, convection. It's actually a photosphere to the corona. It's a full model. And this is the chromosphere part of it. And it's, these images are kind of designed to um, understand. Th these are observations right here. Um, these are the models. So we're making progress. Um, here's another example um, over a larger scale. And the idea now is to try to, you know, put an active region in there and see if we can really understand what's going on, see if we can really drive a coronal mass ejection ourselves. And if we can do that, then we can understand what's going on in the sun. This is just uh, another picture of the same simulation, a little higher up in the atmosphere. <clears throat> and then here's a snapshot of the magnetic fields. Uh, right in that little spot there. So anyway, I guess all I'm saying here is that it's really fun to run models of this and see if it makes any sense when you compare it to observations. And that's kind of the joy of doing theory and modeling. It's to, you know, you get so you work so hard to make a code, right? <laughs> and you're just so glad it works and just doesn't barf on you, right? <laughs> but then, but then when you run it and you see some stuff that kind of looks like what's going on in the actual sun. You go, cool. <laughs> Maybe I didn't waste 10 years of my life. <laughs> so, by the way, this, this is not my simulation. This is actually a simulation. Wow. This is not wow. an actual picture of a sunspot. Um, this particular simulation was done by Matthias Rempel at the High Altitude Observatory in Colorado. And what he does is he takes those equations I showed you and adds the equations of radiative transfer, which are very complicated, but he can only do it in a in a relatively small domain, but look at that. You know, I don't have a movie, um, but I can assure you that looks extremely similar to an actual sunspot. So what he does is he kind of seeds his simulation with a big blob of magnetic field and then just lets convection churn away, and there's so much you can learn from that. Oh, there, I can <laughs> spell the same. So, um, What was I trying to say with all of that? <laughs> it's, you know, what, one of the things I wanted to say is that it, it really is cool, and, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that we could, we can do now that we couldn't do in the past, um, and a lot of that is driven by super supercomputers. Um, I remember when I started, you know, in the '90s, a supercomputer was I thought was a, amazing. Wow, look at all that stuff you can do, and now you, you know, this laptop can do the stuff that they did back then. And so. So the, I guess what I'm saying is that we can take some of these things that we've known about and apply them to supercomputing problems and really try to extend the range of what it is that we can explore. Some of the things that we really, really would love to be able to do and that we're working on is to predict the solar cycle and predict eruptive events. And to do that, I guess I'm arguing you got to have a synergy between observations and modeling. And best yet, better yet, have be able to put the observational data into your models and then try to really learn what's going at, what's going on in the sun. Now I promised 
a quick look at, so I, I, that's kind of the end of the stuff I wanted to say. Um, but I did want to show you guys, uh, just talk a little bit about Solar Probe if you're interested. Um, <laughs> so at, um, so at Berkeley, so there's a, there's a number of instruments on Solar Probe. Um, the instrument that, that is built at Space Sciences Lab is an instrument called Fields. And it's, let me see here, sorry. Uh, and Fields has several things that it's trying to do. Um, it's got, I think there's five antenna, essentially, that are, are designed to measure the electric field at the points where the actual spacecraft is. Um, it also has, I think, three magnetometers so that will give you direct measurements of the magnetic field. So the, 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 this instrument will be kind of going around the sun, uh, getting closer and closer, and, and it'll, like I say, it'll get to about nine solar radii or so. So that's going to give us a wealth of information for the first time about you know, the actual values of the electric magnetic field of the, in the outer corona. We still have to couple it to what's going on closer to the sun, so we still need models and so forth. But that's a basic idea of the fields instrument. Actually, I don't think it stands for anything. It just stands for <laughs> electric magnetic fields, at least. I, I'm, I'm actually on the science team. I, should, I didn't know that. <laughs> anyway, I'll go ahead and stop there, and you guys can pepper me with questions. Hopefully, I didn't bore you to death. <laughs> findings that was most interesting out of Kepler was that other stars seem to be much more variable than they were expecting based on the sun. And yeah. what does our under, how does our understanding of the variability of the sun versus the variability of other stars say about life elsewhere? In oh, the you know, that's, a, that's an awesome question. And it's something I'm very, very interested in, actually. So, I'd like to turn it around a little bit and ask the, and, and rephrase it to say, what can other the activity on other stars teach us about our sun? Uh, because there's you, you have such a more breadth of information of different activities on other stars. I mean, you, you can use our sun um, to kind of infer what might be happening, you know, on other stars. So, but the cool thing about other stars, right, is that. Like, let's say you have a fully convective M dwarf, right? Those things are hugely active. I mean, way more active than our sun. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a stellar astrophysicist, but I, I'm pretty sure they have cycles and so forth like our sun. But one of the you know, theories on our sun, of course, is that the reason we have a cyclic behavior is that in the transition between the radiation zone in the deep part of our sun and the convection, convective envelope, there's a transition there that they call the tachycline, which is like this area where a magnetic field is sheared and where they think it's generated. So, and, and then you can kind of, there's theories to describe our magnetic activity. So the question is, if that's what's causing magnetic, magnetic activity in our sun, you know, how is it happening in stars that are just convective and don't have that transition? You see what I'm saying? Uh -huh. And to the other point you made, what does it say about uh, the chances for life or habitable planets you know, in that star's heliosphere? It's really interesting because we, there, I wrote a proposal like five years ago with Suzanne, maybe longer than that, with Suzanne Hawley. And we proposed a very similar, you know, addressing kind of a similar idea, which is to use Kepler. I mean, they're the real astronomers. So they're going to, I don't, they, they do some magic stuff nowadays. They use spectra to um, determine where star spots are as a function of time, right? So we thought, well, why not you know, take all that information over a, you know, a bunch of Kepler stars and try to use solar models? You know, pretend, you know, just assume it's rotating this fast, assume it's this big, you know, and then just what would happen you know, to a CME if you had that weird of a magnetic configuration and so forth? And people are doing that now. That proposal is never funded, <laughs> as is often the case. 
Um, but, pe but people are doing that now. Uh, there's a guy in our group that's actually run, running space weather simulations on other stars with the express purpose of trying to see what the wind is like you know, near to that star and to see if, if an atmosphere of a planet of a certain size would be shredded off. So it's an excellent question. I, I think the transfer of information goes both ways. And oftentimes there isn't in the scientific community a, you know, a strong of collaboration as there should be between stellar astrophysicists people and geophysicists and solar physicists. We all tend to kind of specialize. So we're, we're, we're all trying to work together on that. It's a really important question. Sure. <laughs> That uh, 11 years sunspot cycle. Yes. Uh, do we know why it's 11 years? Due to the mass. Yeah, I'm sorry. Due more to the mass of, of the sun. Or? Well, and so the the real answer to your question is we do not really understand the solar cycle. Um, I would say though, it's it's not due to the mass necessarily. It's due to the physics of the interior and how the magnetic uh, the dime. The magnetic dynamo is, a create, is essentially the creation of a magnetic field through moving electric plasma. And there's a dynamo on the sun that happens both on global scales, which is a cycle thing that you're talking about, and local scales. So the answer to you know, the activity question in an MDOR probably is that the convection just generated the field on its own without that shear layer. <clears throat> the 11-year cycle, I, I don't, well, I think the safest thing to say is we don't actually understand the global solar dynamo very well, but I don't, I don't think it's the, the mass other than indirectly. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah, I mean the mass, mass controls everything. In some sense, gravity and pressure. So in some sense, yeah, the mass, but it's still, we're not but sure. the details. No, the details are, you know, about how magnetic field is sheared, how things are rotating differentially, how it's transported back down and back up, how long it takes. Yeah, 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 so it's pretty complicated. <laughs> yes? Can I ask about the Carrington event? Have you had? Oh, yeah. I was kind of wondering, has it got, has it got any attention from anybody watching the see about doing something up the there's Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so do you guys know, that, if I'm understanding it correctly, the Car Carrington event is a historical event. Um, I can't remember exactly when it happened, but it was a 1950s, yeah. So it was a super huge. CME. I mean, we didn't. I don't think people really kind of understood the whole process of CMEs at the time. But it was so big that it actually really noticeably disrupted uh, things here at the Earth. And yes, <clears throat> in fact, that has been studied by a group extensively. In fact, uh, at the University of Michigan, they run combined space weather models where they will take a solar model, heliospheric model, an ionospheric model, a magnetospheric model. They call it sun to mud <laughs> and then they try to then they then they ask the question well here's what we think might have happened you know at the surface of the sun right we're going to let it rip through these models and see if we can end up with something that maybe is carrington like so sure yeah it's always good because you know you have to have a scary event like that to scare up funding can you uh, describe the difference between a gas state and a plasma state and the different transitions between uh, states of matter and the sun? Well, yeah, I mean, that's kind of a, a technical question. So uh, the, the simplest answer, I guess, is when I'm doing like fluid um, mechanics stuff, I, I consider that a gas in some sense, even though it's a, it's a dense gas. So something that can be treated like a a bunch of stuff as a uh, mass per unit volume uh, that you can describe in terms of the fluid. You know, that's kind of the typical way of thinking about a gas. A plasma, on the other hand, is when things are, you know, you're thinking of more physics in that case. It's when, when things are, electrons become disassociated, you know, with the atoms, things that don't behave as a gas. There's a lot of physics, there's a lot of separation. You're talking about the microphysics of charged particles. So space physics often deals with plasma. I kind of use the term interchangeably. Um, but MHD modeling, the type of thing that I'm accustomed to is really, um, isn't classic plasma physics, really. It's much more of a um, way of thinking of it in terms of 
old-fashioned Newtonian quantities, amount of stuff per unit volume and so forth. And then we use macroscopic descriptions of the electric and magnetic field. So it's not an ionized plasma in some sense. Does that make sense? Or? So I guess the point is, um, you know, what we see as sort of like lakes and rivers and whatnot is more of radiation and energy. Uh, uh, lakes and, and rivers? The way that it's pictured makes it look more of a gaseous or kind of a liquid. Oh, I, I, see, what <clears throat> I see what you're saying. Um, So you're always looking at radiation. <laughs> Again, it's kind of a complicated problem, but you're inferring the physics of the plasma <laughs> that, that is doing the emitting. So you can see the, the radiation, you, you can see stuff that is lit up at a certain temperature moving around as a function of time. So in your mind, you can kind of, and in simulations, you can kind of interpret that as fluid flow at a particular temperature. But when all the smoke clears, you know, these detectors are detecting photons. Now that's it. So that's all we got. So the rest of it is interpretation. So, <clears throat> yeah. How prepared is, uh, say, the Parker Solar Probe for some of these large CME events? That, you know, I'm sorry. It's, 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 so the Parker Solar Probe, how, how prepared are they for large CME oh. events and, like, you know, the Carrington, Carrington event kind of thing? Oh, okay. You're just wondering if the uh, Solar Probe is going to get fried by the next <laughs> <Yeah>. Carrington. <laughs> well, <laughs> who knows, <Yeah>. man? <laughs> I mean, it's obviously, you know, the guys that... that the engineers that really know what they're doing and build this stuff, <clears throat> they, they, they are very good at, at being able to anticipate contingencies. Um, remember, where that thing is going to be, it's kind of a low density environment. So it's one of those things that if, yeah, sure, if a magnetic, and it, well, actually, I should say this. What am I talking about? They would like a CME <laughs> to pass by it. So sure, they, they want to, you know, you don't want it to be, you know, the half the sun blurting out at you, yeah. but, but you really want to see a C, CME because you, what it's going to do is it's going to, they're going to be strong magnetic fields. There'll be streams of charged particles, but the whole point of that is to measure those fields and measure those particles. So the real answer is, <clears throat> the real answer to your question is bring it on. <laughs> I got a couple of questions. Sure. I always wonder how dense is the sun, like in the photosphere that we're seeing, like like the plasma. How dense is it? Oh, we're how dense is it? Or um, like high so atmosphere, Earth density, or like space kind of density, or what? That's my first. Question. <clears throat> it. Let's see. So I can answer this question exactly, but I don't have the number on the tip of my. You have it on one of your you early slides. It was yeah, one, one of the slides. Yeah. Oh, I missed that. So. But in terms of, uh, that's, that's actually a good question. I really should have that at the tip of my tongue. Um, if I remember it correctly, it's like federally got to the spacing. Um, ten to the about, oh, so, okay, so about, well, the chromosphere is about five times ten to the minus seven grams per cubic centimeter. Um, I don't know why that number <laughs> jumped yeah. out of my head. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be 10 to the minus 5-ish grams per cubic centimeter of the photosphere yeah. based on you know, standard models. Yeah. So uh, that's CGS, so I, I'm not exactly gone. sure what one the atmosphere is of so the Earth. But yeah, so it's pretty wispy. I mean, yeah, 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 sorry, yes, it's yeah. a lot wimpier. But, but I'll tell you, you go 10, 20 megameters Further down, it's not going to be so windy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the second question sure. I had was, yeah. um, you know, in some of those prominences, it um, it almost looks like material is getting sucked back. But it sounded like you were saying that no, you're really seeing like a temperature effect here. Well, so I mean, it may very well be be being yeah. sucked back. I think the point the point I was making is you can't be. 100% sure, you know, because it also could be that things are brightening and, yeah, and dimming. Okay. But but surely whatever is going on there is constrained by the magnetic field, except in kind of crazy circumstances where you know the field there's areas where maybe the field isn't all that strong. So it, it does come down to some details. Yeah. But I was just warning people not to you know always you know it could be the magnetic field moving or yeah. it could be the plasma. Moving. I gotcha. I gotcha. So, sure. Um, 
to to what extent to any extent oh, sorry, it's sorry, not it's okay to any extent um, is are you is your research being pulled in uh, having to do with the you know, trip to Mars in other words people worried about well what could happen while we're on the way what kind of radiation do we have to do oh sure so, for? yeah 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 so um, it's it's not my particular well so that, that, that area of research is really uh, heliophysics, or sorry, a heliospheric physics area. I meaning, so you're wanting to understand eruptions, you know, far afield from the sun, you know, out at Mars and Jupiter and, and the other planets. My research is more, what are the initiation processes of those eruptions? Um, people that do, um, it, so NASA, I mean, obviously NASA for manned spaceflight is very, very interested in that. And there, there's this whole mm, operational aspect of space weather modeling that's based on a number of tried and true, um, but really simplified um, heliospheric models that go a really long way away from the sun. So the challenge really is how much do we trust those, you know, the base, uh, you know based on the models? So what we're trying to do at Berkeley and, and lots of other places is try to understand the physics better in order to have some of the parameterized models that can run in real time be a better representation of what you could expect in the interplanetary environment. And yes, it's super important, right? So um, I, I didn't quite understand until tonight <laughs> that what we see when we see the surface of the sun, we are not seeing nuclear right. interactions. No, it's, you're not. it's actually chemistry that's happening there. Well, is, it's is there chemistry happening? Oh, uh, sure. There's chemistry on, on, on the and the visual surface that we see. Yeah, I mean it's 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 all physics really. It, I mean it's it's Newton's laws of motion and that turbulence. But I think to the crux of your question. No, you're not, see you're not seeing directly the energy from the nuclear reactions. What you are seeing are the photons that have wormed their way through the whole environment. And so all the way up until you get right to that sharp photosphere, it, it, we call it, the, the term is optically thick, which just means you, it's opaque, you can't see through it, which means photons, instead of flying merrily along, are running into each other, being absorbed, remitted, absorbed, Remitted. So when they get to the surface, there's a sudden density change um, that's right at that hydrostatic equilibrium boundary, and suddenly the photon's like, I'm free, <laughs> and it kind of goes shooting out. So I mean, but but it's going, but it's shooting out at a wavelength and energy that is characteristic of the environment at the surface, yeah. and not characteristic of in the environment. Are there down atoms? There. Are there atoms on on in the on the sun's surface. Oh gosh, yes. Yeah. I mean, with with you know, nuclei and electrons. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Well, they're, yeah, everywhere. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. I wasn't sure if they could exist. Yeah, I'm just saying there's atoms uh, everywhere, yeah. uh, basically. So so what I'm talking about in radiation is that you know the atoms are bumping into each other and releasing photons. Yeah. Right. And I'm talking about when you see something, it's it's the photon. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. So uh, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk that the sun is a very variable star. You had this very dramatic slide that looked like on one end there was a, a disk of the sun that uh, didn't have any coronal holes and one that was all coronal holes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I know the slide you're talking about. But, um, so, so presumably that, the, that was the sun on both sides, right? Well, <clears throat> what, it, what it was is a picture of the sun during a <clears throat> minimum. So it was a picture of the corona, coronal activity. Right. Um, at a particular time during the cycle where the sun is, uh, was not very active. Okay. And then it just went through you know, every couple of years through the cycle and just took a representative snapshot. So by the time you got to the other end, it was active. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, so there was this event called, I don't know how to pronounce it properly, the modern minimum. Um, yes, and, yes. And I, I read some more of those possibilities that that could occur again in yeah, the, 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 the 30s. Um, and I wondered if, yeah, so the, so the motor, motor minimum um, is a time where there wasn't much solar activity at all, and it was for an extended period of time. And the question is, can that happen again? And the answer is sure. And in fact, um, I mean, can we predict it? 
<laughs> nope. Um, <laughs> in fact, people were saying, oh my God, we could be in a monitor minimum you know, in a, one of the recent cycles. It turned out we weren't. So these are the types of things that we're trying to understand in models of the global dynamo. Mm -hmm. I'd like to make time sure for one that, more? Or? Yeah, yes, go sure. ahead, one more, please. I, I, I just want to follow up on the question that you asked just before, mm -hmm. just so that I really understand this. So the light and, and, the, and the heat that we feel from the sun mm -hmm. right now, is that originated about 100,000 years ago in the core? Yeah, uh, yeah, the, the, the photons, yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, although, yeah, to, to be fair, it was radiated a couple of... Right, right, radiated. Yeah, eight minutes ago. Eight minutes ago, I get that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and so but it's... But the actual, the actual... The, yeah, the, the energy, the energy, the energy from that uh, reaction, it's, a, it's, not the, it's not the same photon. <laughs> <laughs> right, so so basically, photons are owl bump, you know, re emit, owl bump, re emit, owl bump, and it takes owl bumps for, you know, 100,000 years, and then finally you get an owl bump and wee! <laughs> so that's a technical. I hope that uh, we see all of you here next month for the talk uh, also about the EV scope demonstration. This will be very interesting, and I want to thank you so much oh. for being here tonight. Here's a picture from Iris. From oh, Iris, right. I didn't even mention Iris. Well, she's here now. <laughs> <laughs> so, Great.